Chris Riley, one of the school board members uh, from here in Rockton. I've got, uh, I guess, three kids in the school now. We've got twins in the third grade, and then we have a three-year-old in the preschool. Um, so, so I'm going to cover the first two slides, and then Andrew Jones is going to take over on the rest uh, of it. So, yeah. Uh, but we'll all let's let's start with like introduction to the whole crew. Okay. I'm I'm Tammy Benoit. I just take notes and give them to Lisa. <laughs> uh, Rodney Rainville, uh, school board director, Bethel. Lisa McCrory, uh, school board director and clerk for, and I live in Bethel. Andrew Bowen, elementary principal, both in Bethel and Bethel resident. Jess Ryan, school board director, Royalton. Andrew Jones, I'm school board director, vice chair um, for Memorial We're missing Owen Bradley tonight. He's got a previous uh, personal thing he's doing. Uh, I'm Bruce Labs, the superintendent. I'm Tara Weatherow. I'm the business manager for the SU. I'm Reba Crackett, the high school principal. And I'm David Wallace, the elementary principal here in South Burlington. Okay. So, uh, I guess there's a couple of different things that go into the development of our budget. Uh, one of them is uh, from from last school year, so FY19. Um, it's not the current year, but last year uh, we did have a, a $350,247 uh, deficit. Um, so that was a combination of uh, several different uh, factors. One was there was a $105,000 shortfall on the revenue side on tuition. So, less students uh, than what we had budgeted for uh, in terms of tuition students. Uh, another issue is uh, for HRAs, uh, the, the health, uh, was it, what's it, our scheme? Health, health reimbursement person. arrangements. Yeah, health reimbursement arrangement. It uh, wasn't budgeted properly, so there was a $50,000 uh, shortfall on that. Uh, our SU office, there was an overage of $104,000 that we were uh, responsible for as part of our school district to the FCU. Uh, the SPED, uh, so the special education uh, funding was also uh, $100,000 shortfall that was our portion to cover. Uh, we also had some office understaffing, so, um, so like here, I think it was here in the front office, uh, we had some, we were understaffed in, uh, in terms of what was budgeted for positions, so there was a $50,000 uh, shortfall on that. Uh, and then for grounds and maintenance, uh, we uh, uh, had new contracts for uh, mowing and snow plowing, and so there was a, and then there was other maintenance issues over the year that uh, uh, went fifty thousand dollars over what we budgeted, and then uh, and then merger facilities work. Uh, there was also an additional fifty thousand on that. Yeah, some of that was um, like the middle school shop or, or uh, maker space. You know that they wound up. Developing that more than had been budgeted for, and so that's that's not necessarily stuff that was directly related to the merger, but more <coughs> added things that happened. But that happened before we realized that there was a deficit. So I just want to make sure I understand: these are overs and unders relative to budget, not relative to the prior year. Is that right? So yeah, nineteen. Nine, so a year ago. So if there's a maintenance increase, it's not that the maintenance necessarily went up by any certain amount, it's just that we were off the budget by that. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but the maintenance contract did go up significantly. And so that's why the we maintenance budget. may have gone up by three hundred thousand, but you only budgeted for two hundred an increase of two hundred and fifty thousand. Right. This yeah, what the maintenance yes. cost versus what was budgeted. So this is just how we were off the budget estimates. Right. Okay. Thank you. So in our current budget year, this physical year, FY20, uh, we, in response to those uh, those budget uh, differences, we've uh, the, the principals and the staff at the, at the Bethel and, and Royalton campuses have worked on uh, limiting spending on any non-essential items uh, to help try to bridge some of those gaps uh, between what was uh, in last year's budget and, uh, versus this year. Uh, so trying to absorb a, as much of that difference this year as we could so that it doesn't get passed along uh, into future budgets. So, um, 
So for our current budget process for going into FY20, so what's going to be coming up for voting uh, here in a couple of weeks, uh, our goal coming into the budget process was to keep the, uh, the rates uh, equal or keep the equalized rates level. So our goal was to try to have our spending be the same uh, for the coming year as it was in the current year. Uh, so uh, in the original first draft of the budget, uh, it did end up going up by uh, 7% due to different uh, uh, contractual matters in terms of staff raises, uh, health care spending increases. Uh, so uh, from there, we worked on trying to uh, address that 7% and bring it down to a lower value uh, by decreasing any non-staff spending uh, and then cleaning up the budget. And that brought us down to a 3% increase. Uh, so uh, some of this included reducing staffing by 2.7 FTE, um, and which included trimming some of the elementary staff to better match the student levels. So at each campus, uh, we're going down one elementary school position. Um, and then, uh, um, and so that got us to a better match with what the student levels were uh, before uh, CLA and incentive decreases. When we looked at the budget, there were additional cuts that we could make to get us all the way down so that what we're proposing isn't actually all the way down to the same as the, this current year's uh, uh, budgeted amounts. Uh, we considered further, further cuts, uh, but we thought that they were going to have too much of a negative impact on the students. So things were, that were considered were, you know, we could have potentially eliminated French uh, uh, classes from the high school and only offered Spanish uh, uh, in face in the classes. Um, didn't really want to do that. Uh, it would have put us as one, I think, the only high school in the area that was only offering one foreign language if we don't offer French uh, in addition to offering Spanish, so something we didn't want to do. Um, there was also going to be a cut, potentially, of uh, cutting one social studies class uh, from the high school. Uh, so and that's not just, well, not, not a section of a class, but actually one specific topic, uh, a specialized course uh, from social studies. So uh, that was, again, something we didn't really want to do. Uh, and then we also were looking at, uh, you know, we could cut family and consumer science uh, from the program, uh, potentially, uh, just based on uh, potential enrollments. And then the other one was outdoor education coordinator position at the high school was another position that we could have cut. Uh, um, but at the time, we don't want to. I guess right now, the goal is to try to offer it for freshmen uh, and try to build it up. Currently, there's not a lot of interest among the upper classmen students uh, for it. So the goal was to try to offer it to like the ninth graders, I believe, right? All right. So I'm going to take over and talk about what we wound up with. Um, so, oops, that's, so to talk about how spending changed between um, last year and this year. Um, going into the budget, we um, were budgeting staff raises of 3%. We haven't finished negotiations or anything, but that's kind of a ballpark figure for this, what we're looking at. And, we're looking at pretty steep health insurance increases of 12% this year. Um, we also had our SPED assessment is up $138,000, which is 13%. And a lot of the reasons in the SU assessment is up 7.5%. So the SU budget and the SPED budget face the same health insurance increases and uh, staff raises and stuff that the rest of the budget does. So that's part of the reason those are up. Another part is that with our changing um, Student populations throughout this SU, um, our percentage is up a little bit this year. So that's part, another part of the reason that's up a little bit. Um, but with those four things, that was a lot of money that was kind of added. And so um, Chris talked about how we, um, the administration went through the non-discretionary parts of the, or the non-staff parts of the budget we tried to trim as much as we could. Um, some of the places, um, that were decreased were uh, field trips and equipment and books and supplies. So we tried to get that down as low as we could for this year, um, either delaying spending for future years or just um, working on alternate funding sources like field trips might be um, done through fundraising instead of through the school budget. Um, so um, 
decrease those as much as we could uh, without impacting things too much. Um, looking at the budget itself, there's a lot of categories that um, things are slightly different because we have to rebalance things or try to rebalance things to better reflect what actual spending was like. Um, you know, this is the first year going into the budget that we actually have a full year of spending from FY19 that we can use to check um, how well things were budgeted in previous years. So, um, and going into the merger, in addition to combining the two um, districts' books, we were also using a new chart of accounts. And so there were some places where you know the spending was happening in this category, but we budgeted in this category, so things have been shifting around a bit. So uh, if you're looking at the budget and things, there's one category that's down, it might be that the spending was happening in a different spot, so it might not be happening. It's not there, it might just be a new um, And yeah, so in addition to the um, uh, non-staff spending, we also reduced elementary staff by two to try and better match recommended class sizes, and uh, there was also a half of a custodial position in Bethel, that was a result of their time, and, and uh, point two position in uh, uh, work work-based learning. Uh, and that was, we had a full-time staff member who wanted to be at point eight, so we accepted that. Um, so anyway, the net result for the spending was that we went from 11 million 118,000 to 12,098,000. Um, on the revenue side, we did have more tuition students this year than we had our first year in FY19, so um, we increased the tuition revenue that we're projecting for this year to reflect that. Um, and part of that was that we had um, a larger freshman class than we did um, the upperclassmen classes. So if you look at you know, our tuition numbers, it's heavily kind of, we have more freshmen and it kind of drops off as you get older. So we're kind of hoping that that trend is going to continue and we'll have stronger um, incoming classes as people are able to see you know, what our school system offers now that the merger has been implemented. Um, and so our work, tuition revenue is up $150,000. Um, but that's offset some way the federal funds decreased by $60,000 we had a balance carry over last year, which with our deficit, we're not adding any money into the budget this year to that, so uh, that's offset some. So our uh, revenue was up a little bit, but not so much. Um, so we're good. The final piece of what goes into per people spending enrollment, uh, our, our equalized pupils were essentially flat this year. It's down very slightly, but uh, essentially flat. But uh, one of the things to look at is that um, if you look at our average daily membership, which the Equalized Pupils is based on a two-year average of our average daily membership, um, this shows how our two towns working together really can help. Um, Royalton's average daily membership was down 10% this year, which would have been a big um, impact on if Royalton was still trying to go it alone. Um, but Bethel's was up 8%, so in the end, we wound up being pretty level as far as equalized people. So that just shows how, you know, in previous years, Bethel's ADM has been down in rural and has been helping out with Bethel. So, you know, our two towns working together, that'd be a good thing. Um, all right, so to look at how this actually translates to a tax rate, um, to calculate taxes, you take your per people spending, which is your spending minus your revenue, divided by your equalized pupils. And then you take that and divide that by the state yield and take away the merger incentive. And then to get the final rate, you take that rate and divide it by the common level of appraisal. And we'll go through those steps now. Um, so overall, our spending was up 2.4%. Uh, our revenue is down, or up 5.2%. So our net spending is up 2%, 2.1%. Equalized people stay the same. So our per-pupil spending is up 2.1%. But um, the state yield, which is how the state translates a per-pupil spending into a tax rate, is up 2.2%. Um, 
And so that means our rate actually, our preliminary rate actually is staying level. Um, and the way that that works is as the tax base of the state increases, you know, property values go up and new properties are built. So as the tax base of the, base of the state increases, they have to, you know, going with the same tax rate would bring in more money for them the following year than it did the previous year. So they use the state yield to adjust it so that in order to bring in the same amount of money, they can set the rate a little bit lower. And so if we, our spending increases at the same rate the yield does, then our tax rate doesn't increase. So in this case, we were able to keep the preliminary, preliminary rate level, but because we're still in the period where we're receiving merger incentives and those are slowly phasing away, um, the merger incentive is two cents less this year, and that's why the equalized rate is up two cents, or 1.1%. And then to look at the final rates in each town, um, this is based on um, taking the equalized rate and dividing out the CLA, uh, which is the factor that um, is based on how uh, appraised values compare to actual land sales, um, so that the state is taxing you based on the closer to the real value of your house, as opposed to the appraised value. Um, the Bethel CLA is down um, seven tenths of a percent, and so the final increase in Bethel's tax rate is 1.9 percent. Um, Royalton's CLA was down as well, um, but because Royalton's equalized rate last year was capped um, at the five percent increase, it wasn't the same equalized rate Bethel had, so. Um, it was capped at 1.603 last year, and it's not going to be capped this year, so Royalton's rate is going up, would go up 4% on this. Um, this is the last year that we're going to have different equalized rates between Bethel and Royalton, so from now on they're going to be the same, which makes things easier from a management perspective. Um, so that's kind of how all the tax rate things work out. Um, I guess, does anybody have any questions about that side of things? Just so I can clear my head, the average daily membership is the average number of students in school in an average day? In October. Oh, in October. Okay. Yes. And then the equalized pupils is the number over two years. Well, so they take the number over two years, but then take into account that, like, they don't give you as many equalized pupils for a preschooler as they do a regular student. They give you more for a high schooler, right. and they give you more if you have, based on your poverty levels and English as a second language. So, so it's, it's kind of complicated based on what they think your resource needs will be. Right. Okay. Resource needs and then the two year. And then that. Yeah, it's a complicated formula, which. Someone in the state office. Yeah. When, um, <clears throat> when you say this is the last year that the rate, tax rates are different for Royalton and Bethel, how, how do they decide, how did you, the, the people that made the decision, how was how that made? So when we first merged, when you first merged, your tax rates can only change by 5% uh, each year. Your equalized tax rate can only change by 5%. So Royalton's is, was capped at a lower rate because we started at a lower rate. Methyl's was up here. So you know we went up 5% and they came down 5%. And then they came down another. Uh, so uh, we'd have to kind of go back. But basically, Royalton's has been capped at a lower rate because we've been doing 5% increases. But it's not going to be capped anymore. So we're going to be in the same rate from now on. It's just the way the math works out. Does that make sense? Well, it doesn't to me, but I'm not a mathematician. Sure. Thank you. We decided that at, before we merged, that during the merger meeting, that it would be equal in three years, right? Wow. Well, well that's yeah. what we estimated. What we estimated, yeah. yeah. The they equalized it out. <clears throat> they equalized it out over those years to sort of make it like an on-ramping for all the involved groups, so that there wasn't a sudden change in, in different towns' tax rates from, for 
from prior to merger to after merger to where it was there was sort of an on ramping, uh, so similar to what happens in other times when there's like. I guess, like when we've had some different contractual changes or when the SU merged, there was some on-ramping and merging of, of different contracts among the employees and stuff to get everybody on one contract. So it's, it was the same sort of thing here where rather than just changing us all immediately, there was a three-year phase-in period was how they did that 5% staging. The CLAs will still be different. Yes, CLAs will right. still be different. Our equalized rates will be the same. assumptions and how it impacts the budgets and how that impacts the tax rates. Okay. Um, so do you want to have, I have some questions about the budgets unrelated to the tax rates. Should sure. I ask those no now? Problem. So one of them was unrelated tax rates. Um, there was an assumption last year about tuition revenue and we over budgeted by 150k and tuition revenue was low. Yep. And this well, year. That was for FY19. Okay. Was. Now we're forecasting an increase in tuition revenue so, by 150k. So last year, or when we first <coughs> we budgeted, I think it was six hundred and forty thousand right. dollars, and we got basically five hundred. Right. And so um, when we went into FY20, so last year when we were doing our budget, we set the tuition rate or tuition expected tuition at five hundred thousand. Okay. So. We decreased it that last year. This year, we have so far received somewhere Jeremy, around 600. And do you want me to give the same answer I gave last night? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so, where I'm going to be. Where I'm going to be. What is your confidence? Yep, I, what is your confidence in tuition, whatever yep. tuition revenue you're forecasting, and what is being done? to aggressively market the school to bring in tuition revenue? That part I can't answer. I'll leave that up to the administrators. Okay. But I can tell you the mentality behind the budget number for the tuition revenue. We took this year's 9th through 11th graders with the expectation that they're going to stay at the school because they're here now. And that was 33 students. Mm -hmm. And we multiplied that by the FY21 announced tuition rate. Okay. because that was set by the board in January and that was a higher amount. So that was the base of it. And then we added a projection of five new freshmen coming in. So that's where we got the number. So we were very conservative as far as what we projected for new students, but kept the 9 through 11 students that are currently here. We more aggressive in marketing. That's the principles. So the, the board charged... The, me, the high school principal, uh, last year with coming up with a plan to do that. Um, and so this year we'll, we'll execute the plan as we did last year, um, which is framed around an open house for all students that we potentially could serve. Um, we, I, what we do is identify all the eight possible eighth graders uh, that we can identify and send out invitations to those families. Um, to an open house, uh, put an ad in the Randolph Herald, um, publicize the event you know, through Facebook, social media, those other things. Um, and we did a pretty good job with that last year. It was a pretty successful event. Um, the majority of students were already in the middle school and most of them were coming to learn about the school. Uh, but of the students who weren't in our, you know, within the district, uh, we had a, a relatively high rate of recruitment from them. Uh, so, you know, there are another, another number of anecdotal examples where parents and students were kind of on the fence and not sure what they wanted to do. And after that open house experience left, yeah, this is what I want to do. Uh, so we, we felt pretty good about that. You know, the reality is that the eighth, you know, the size of the eighth grade in Chelsea is not that big. Uh, so the pool of students that we're recruiting from is, is limited in its potential uh, in terms of total gains that we could make. But... Uh, I mean, we, we have seen students come into the district kind of continually throughout the year. We just uh, had a new student last week and a new student the week before. Uh, so we feel good that 
people are feeling a sense of confidence in, in what's being offered at the high school, where my sense when I started 18 months ago was there was a lot of, like, we don't know if this merger is going to be good or not. There was a lot of questioning of that. Uh, maybe some people stayed away the first year because they wanted to see how it panned out before they jumped in the water. Uh, yeah, that, the first year, too, that FY19, the shortfall, <coughs> When we came up with that number, we didn't we didn't really have many tuition students, and it was sort of a, you know we, with the new merged union school, it was a, sort of a, a best guess as to what the number was going to be with Chelsea's high school closing and with Rochester's high school closing, and so our initial estimate was off. Uh, but now, with a couple of years of data and knowing how what grade each of those incoming tuition students are in, we can do better estimates of what we're going to have the following year in terms of tuition students, as Tara said, with how we're estimating incoming freshmen. Just one follow-up for me on the same topic. Do you guys, in addition to having open houses, do you also, like with guidance or whatever, go to these other locations mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and promote? Yeah, so we've been to two you know, school fairs this year to, you know, be a presence. We have a little slideshow we can take on the road with us to say these are the great things that are happening. Um, you know, so we would have gone to one in Chelsea last fall around Thanksgiving, uh, which is kind of one of the more important ones since those students can all easily choose to come here. And then, and then one other follow-up, do you, do you in, in, in addition to promoting the goodness of this particular school, do you also do a competitive analysis against our closest rivals, you know? to see how we stand, stand academically and other ways? We haven't done a formal competitive analysis. You know, we, we do keep track of things such as the strength of our instrument lessons and our music program and things that we offer that some of the other schools just can't offer. Um, yeah, and I think the board has, you know, when we're talking about cuts, uh, the board's made a commitment to sustaining programs that exist here. So I think uh, that would be powerful, like if you had a one-page flyer and if you go to these other locations, like not just Chelsea, but if you go to Sharon and if you go to Woodstock, and you go around the, the circle in Randolph, and you have a one-page flyer and said, here's Randolph, here's Woodstock, yeah. here's us. Yeah, we don't have to just go to Chelsea. Let's yeah, yeah. broaden the search. Just, just like an idea. <laughs> Our stuff, man. We got some good stuff here. Yeah. We do have a flyer, and amongst the things that are listed are some of the unique programs. Like, I think we're the only school near that offers introductory guitar lessons. That sort of thing. Um, we even uh, have gone to elementary schools to try to get the kids into the middle school. So, uh, inviting them in for field trips and whatnot. I'm going to add that to my to do list. I guess I have a, a broader question. I've, I've heard tonight that you guys have had to make tough decisions about programming and not affecting students with language or music or whatever. And I was at a meeting a couple of months ago, and, and Lori was concerned about curriculum scheduling and because of financial constraints and so on. The whole reason for the merger, and I was, you guys are all aware, I was very involved in pushing for consolidation five, six, long, many, many years ago, and really thinking about the benefits. And other people sitting around here had strong concerns about consolidation. And I won't say who they are, but <laughs> people sitting here know who they are. And the argument in favor of it was we can not only help the taxpayers with cost efficiencies through a larger critical mass, but also provide enhanced educational opportunities. We can have it both ways. And was that too Pollyannish? Are we now we're struggling with finances and talking about cutting back on programming? Were, were, was that too many rosy eyes in terms of the benefits of consolidation? I know it's hard, but we should, I still believe we should be able to have efficient economics without having to cut back on programming. Am I wrong? 
some of the, I think, or at least one of them is one of the costs that's out of our sort of out of our control is the healthcare costs increase. Uh, you know, I don't think that was that predicted. Was in the equation, yeah, that wasn't and, predicted. So and so we've had a couple of years in a row now of of double digit increases in healthcare. So it's sort of, you know, it was I think it was ten was it ten percent? So, or so close arguably, to 10 last year, that would be even worse. Yeah. Yes, I, I believe so. Just. If I could address it uh, coming from the other five towns in this SU, developing budgets with them, they're all up against the cap. Uh, it's all, it's, you know, they're trying to expand things and offer opportunities for kids at a, at a cost with some of these other things, like was just said, that are hard to control. Um, and I think this board, um, we anguished with with trying not to take away opportunities. Um, you know, we, we did what we were told to do, and that is to take it down to a zero, zero increase. And then that was, going to, that was going to affect programming, and the board really didn't want to do that. And I applaud them for that, uh, because we had told the towns that we were going to try to be very, very cost effective this year and conservative this year on the taxpayers. But, um, you know, that's basically the reality of, of now, what, two years out after we've, we've merged. Uh, healthcare is still going nuts. We've, we're going to be, you know, settling a teacher and a support staff contract, and we don't know where that's going right now, uh, but that's a factor that you can never predict two years ago. Uh, so there's just obstacles, and uh, I, I guess I can't say anything else. One, one thing that was shared last night, because uh, there were a lot of similar questions, was just highlighting the fact that, you know, before the merger, there were less opportunities, and with the merger, both schools had an opportunity to provide more, you know, more electives, more opportunities to have access to those electives, and and talking about certain students in the high school level grades that had options to go to early college or to leave the, the district and take advantage of either um, RTCC or Votech Vo or, or go to take an early college. And I can think of at least three seniors right now that, are, that, that could have gone to early college this year, but because of the, the camaraderie and the success of the merger and the, the opportunities of class selections, they chose to stay. And, and so those are three, three students that stayed within the district because of a number of factors. And that's a, to me, that's a sign that we're really doing the right thing. Now, uh, you know, for fiscal year 19, the, the numbers were a little lower, but as we've all, you know, are surmising, it's because people, some people were like, I wanna see what's gonna happen first. You know, there were some people that just opted out and, and some kids are coming back in now that we're demonstrating what we have to offer. I think last year when we had, you know, you know, in the, the extracurricular, the, the drama, the athletics, I mean, the music, there's so many things that are, are continuing to succeed. And, and for last year with sports to have both the softball team and the baseball team get, um, become state champions in the district, in the division three, was for the first year of a merger was amazing and i have two high school students and they've really blended in well with from bethel to south royalton and i would say some of their best friends live in south royalton right now I, you know they're always out doing something with this new gaggle of friends so i'm as a parent i'm really happy with what i've seen and as a board when we were talking about like okay if we're going to get to a zero a level budget, we were going to have to cut positions and classes and the things that we might have had to take out were things that we had added as a result of the merger that we really just didn't want to take any languages out. We didn't want, you know, so we chose, We, as a board, we felt like it's better to, to increase by 2% to make sure that those opportunities are still there for the students. Cause it wasn't going to be good. It wouldn't hit. Our conscience wouldn't have been able to have taken that hit. Um, it'll be up to the voters to decide. Well, I can't speak for the community. I can only speak for myself. <coughs> uh, I guess I'll speak for my wife who can't be here tonight. But 
we're taxpayers. We don't like to see taxes go up. Mm -hmm. But please don't shortchange the students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you're looking at programming. Find ways to save money and cut money that doesn't affect programming. Mm -hmm. And as we are creating this budget, we really look line by line at everything. We put a lot of time into it with, with, with everybody, just, just make, looking at what was budgeted last year and, and how much was actually spent and then knowing where we could trim. And some of those line items were a little bit higher than what they needed to be because there were certain costs that came in with um, just the cost of the merger. And then we realized, okay, well, that, was, that extra money was there because of merger costs, which are no longer necessary. So we were really able to trim a lot of areas that um, hadn't really been seen the first round of, of the budget process. So I think we did a really good job cleaning and we're con constantly tracking things now in case we have to continue doing some trimming without taking away from the students, for sure. And the deficit comes into play a lot here too, the, the current deficit, without it, you'd be holding the line and we'd, we'd be in a, in a better shape and so, I think maybe when you present to the greater town, you may want to um, really highlight the fact that that deficit is maybe related, maybe it's not related to the merger. I mean, you had two different budgets that were brought in, but it's the turnover of the business director, uh, business administrators, the five, four or five turnovers. That was very unfortunate. <coughs> and that is what really is the, the root cause of your deficit. And that's independent of the merger. So, but there are, there are, you know, there are, commonalities of the two different, bring two different uh, ledgers together, um, that's, that's got to make it even more difficult. But I think you may want to highlight that, that that is independent, I guess, of the merger and not, a, not because of it. The turnover. Mm -hmm. The turnover. Of the but that turnover that killed had, had a real financial cost. It wasn't yeah. just. Yeah, that's what I mean. It, it, it uh, hurt, yeah. and, and, but it's independent turnover of the merger. Cost and you may want to highlight cost. that for, for naysayers. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned health care costs as a challenge because they're really outside of the schools and school board's control. What about administrative costs due to state or state and federal federal requirements? They've always been there. Are they getting worse? I mean, how, what percentage of the school expenses are due to administrative burdens just to administer what the state requires. And I'll fold in the SU, not just, not just the school, but the SU, because you're paying for the SU. H how much of our burden is due to administrative state requirements? There's a tremendous push from Montpelier to move a lot of the local, the traditional local control issues to the SU. Is that going to raise costs or lower No, I'm, I'm talking about things like busing and um, uh, special education, and now we're hearing uh, food service, that basically they want it in a centralized situation as opposed to what the districts did. And that's not of our making. We're, that's of their making. Uh, and I know every place I go, uh, people are railing about that because they they believe that that it's it's outside of their realm that they have no control over it. All of a sudden, um, see again, I'm a great believer. If you centralize, you should be able to lower costs. But it appears that when we do centralize, the costs go up. They don't get lower. So I'm leery. Well, about I mean, there's the factors we talked about: the health insurance and salaries and things like that are always going to be in play. In play. Um, we, we uh, it's staggering to me how much health care has accelerated over the last, but it's, it's the generation that are retiring, I guess. What's the SU supervisory headcount compared to the, as a part of the overall school headcount? I think all the faculty in all the schools 
and the SU. What's the SU administrative? Are you talking about the supervisor in the central office? Or yeah, the, the central office to run all the schools. We yeah. have. There's a list of all the staff and the reports. Is, is, is it 3%? Yeah. Is it 10%? I think we have 15 people in the central office that run one program or That's another. And yet, but five of them are paid 100% by grants. By grants. Well, there's a million dollars in grants that come into the SU. A million. A little over a million, actually. Cynthia, is it one one million one hundred thousand well, something like that? A million six, I think. But uh, the other, just as somebody who runs one set of programs, the paperwork to do the uh, the grants is twice as much as it used to be, and the grants are less than they used to be, and every time we turn around, it's the fast. The food has to be. You have so much documentation that it's absolutely ridiculous. And that, I think, is taking up our administrative time. And then, and then within the schools, what's the, what's the faculty headcount as a percentage of the total headcount? Is it three quarters, 60 percent, 90 percent? Because when the rubber hits the road for programming, it's, it's the faculty that how big is the faculty compared to the whole? Like, do you want to include janitorial and food service and all that stuff? Or secretaries? Or like faculty versus administration? Well, it's not all headcount is the same, right? It's professional headcount. All, all the head, I mean, all the personnel are listed on pages six, seven, and eight in this report. But we don't, we don't have the metrics. We have to sit and do some calculations. Well, you know, one of the cuts that has been made with this proposed budget is taking away one elementary teacher in both schools to bring the uh, student numbers per classroom to more like 17 students per classroom, where some of them were getting to be, you know, less than 10 students with, with a teacher. And, and those changes, as the administrator said last night, probably would have happened anyway just to make sure that there was the right student to teacher ratio that was a little more, you know, responsible. I'm just assuming you guys have scrubbed through all those numbers. Mm -hmm. There's no more fat, right? We're, we're trimming a lot, <laughs> as much as we can. Yeah. Well, in a way, you're at, at the elementary school, you're at the mercy of uh, the birth rate. I mean, they either live there or they don't live there. Mm -hmm. Well, and sometimes a family of three or four kids come into town, or sometimes they move out, and all of a sudden, that puts quite a hit on a small, small city. Right. It's a big percentage of the small town. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, one follow-up question on ESU is, are we still, um, we're working the lion's share of, of the assessment are we not still, are we still equally you want, You're paying 41%. 41%, but are we still equally proportioned from a representation at the SU board level? Are we the same number as First Branch and Stratford and Sharon? Yes. It, yeah. Right. It's, you know, is that ever going to change? There, There is a process in motion. I don't know what the status I, is. I missed the second the half of your representation versus assessment. So we're 41% assessed, but we're... We don't. Uh, we're, we're given a lot of we, money, and we don't have a proportionate yeah. share of us. We did. Yeah. We did try changing that kind of immediately after they did. the merger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be worth trying again because that was before Tumbridge and Chelsea were fully through their merger, and Sharon and Rochester and Stockbridge. So we might. So let me bring just, it up again. as a follow-up, just how do you, whoever's on the SU board from this board, how do you feel your representation? Do you feel it's okay and fair or do you feel you take advantage of it? I think uh, we do a very good job at it. We, we have better attendance than any other district. Yeah, we cool. always, <clears throat> we have three members on the SU board and we usually show up with four or five of us at the meeting. We have two actors. Even though the two actors can't vote, they can still voice their opinion. So it's, we're always, and even like the executive board, which is just the chairman goes to, Andrew and I, well, we've all gone to the executive boards as members of the public to, to represent our district. Do you so we, we overrun them. I mean, we, that, we don't. That, 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 that. <laughs> Do you ever come across a conflict, though, where like a Stratford is looking for an allocation that doesn't benefit this district or as an example? It hasn't been an issue. It hasn't been an issue yet. I mean, okay, thank you. 
but we, we, we're, we're fairly noisy at the board meetings. <laughs> um, to add on that, you know, there's one thing that I've never properly understood, and I always think of it during the actual meeting, and I just want to go home and vote, uh, and vote and go home in that order. Um, I still, despite my best efforts, not a math person, not wrap my head around, okay, there's X amount of money in our budget that goes to special education. It's distributed through the SU. How did we end up with a deficit? How, because because uh, that's sort of the impression I had in my head, was we just threw a certain amount of money into a big pot in the SU, and then special education was sort of evenly distributed from there. Because no, that way no one district would end up holding all the, having to pay out all the special education. So like, you know, almost like an insurance kind of thing. So that, you know, the SU would handle special education funds, and with South Royalton Elementary had three kids, the money would come out there for those three kids. I think that was wrong, because otherwise I don't see how we end up holding the bag for $150,000 or whatever the quantity is, don't quote me, um, for a deficit specifically in special education. And so uh, now I'm just sort of like, but but how does this work again? Uh, can someone break it down to very small parts? <laughs> and I think the overall deficit was like two hundred. Okay, so it was like a bar or and then portion that's of that. Yeah, that's your portion. So that's our forty percent. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the special education budget, and I hope I can say this, and Deb won't scold me tomorrow if I explain it right. Not here, Steve. Right. We'll so, recording it. Right. So the special education budget is established by prior year expenditures. We clearly can't project if new students need evaluations, if they need an outside of the district placement. We have no control over those transportation costs based on whatever their plan ends up being, where they need to have an out of district placement. Those are things that you only can do your best projections on. So when the year actually starts and the expenditures start happening, that's yeah. when the special and education budget can go awry. Okay. Same thing happened in special education that happened in each of the member districts and also happened in the central office. All of the special education paraprofessionals and teachers are all employees of the supervisor union under special education. Okay. So they had the same increase in benefits and they receive the same benefits that everybody else does that's on the master agreement or on the support staff agreement. So when the HRA went into place, that exact same impact happened on special education just like it did for the districts and just like it did for the central office staff. Okay. So those are some of the factors as to what happened in FY19. Yeah. This year, we tried, why the increase was a little bit higher than what it has been historically is because we really did budget based on the service plan that special education is required to submit to the state of Vermont. And in the past, that number's been reduced after the submission's been done to try and keep it. And then that's where we end up having a deficit in the end. So this year's budget was based on the service plan that was submitted by special education to the agency. Is that it, it, from a year ago? Yes. Yeah, from a year ago's expenditures. We so, tend to run in the arrears with the AOE for one to two years at a time when we're building these. So I hope I explained no, that. It's, Im it's important that <laughs> like you said, know. You know, you have an assumption in your head and then something cracks that assumption and you go, well, I don't know. <laughs> it's important that you know, too, that um, a lot of people look at the special ed budget and they say, oh, I, we can't deal with that. That's yeah. just what it is. And we've got to pay it. And we don't have any control over it. When five years ago, uh, when we started looking at this, um, we had 57 kids out of district. Now those out of district costs can range um, for the new school in, I think that's in Mount Pillar, $123,000 uh, a year for, for a student or um, down to uh, East Valley Academy, which is a little over 30,000. And I'm not including transportation. So we took an average of all the placements that we had and, and average them out um, when we were discuss, trying to figure out uh, starting the restorative program. Um, and that average uh, of all the placements that we put out was about 76,000. 
Um, we've put 27 kids through that restorative program since 2015. 41% of those kids have gone back to class without AIDS, which is a huge savings. Um, and, and I can quote you that some of the numbers from the study that we did um, after, uh, for South Royalton, it saved $266,385. For Bethel, it's $380,550. And I can go, I mean, that's, that's a half a million dollars with the two of them combined. Because it's coming from the state, the money coming from the state, um, that's not something that people know about or think about or can produce those numbers. But we were being questioned by the boards about, you know, why, are we, why we have this program and what good is it doing? I've tried to, we've tried to make people understand that um, Act 173 is coming probably next year. And we've been told by the Secretary of Education to grow your own programs because we're not going to have the money. We're going to get a block grant and you have to live with that money. They're not going to be funded from, from Alpelier anymore uh, than that. And so they said, you guys need to form your own programs because you're not going to have the money to send to the new school or all these other places. And so what Tara told you is, is part of the issue. We can't predict how many kids will be tested at thousands of dollars a pop every year. We can't know who's going to move into the district and what kind of needs they're going to have. Um, or family situations for kids in our district that cause them to go in a different direction. Um, I'm, can't, you know, we now have, we had 52 kids out of district five years ago and we have 27 now. And so it's been <coughs> cut in half. And all of that is saving a tremendous amount of money, but it's hard to see. Yeah. It's hard to visualize. Well, especially since the kids were out of district I like to use the FY19 actuals against the proposed FY21 proposed. Is that the best way to, to do a comparison? Because what I'm trying to say, like what we actually spent last versus what is in the next four going budget. Is that, a, is that a, a, an accurate way to do my comparison? It's more, I mean, what we budgeted, yes, we can do that. But when we built the budget, we actually look at we look at that as a fact but we also look at this year and then make projections based on what we budgeted for this year, what we're trending for this year. And that's the FY20 20 20 approved. approved, yeah. Okay. Because we don't have the actuals, obviously, because we're only halfway through the year. But yes, you can look at that. But to bear in mind that there are expenditures in FY19 that, as addressed by Andrew and I believe Chris's presentation, there, several of them were one-time expenditures and may not be reflective in following years. Okay, also. And, is, and thank you. And in FY19 actuals, are they um, the combined ledgers um, from there is, schools? There is no more combining ledgers as of FY19 mm -hmm. because that was that was the one, one just, budget. I'm just wondering about the. Uh, the improprieties that led to the deficit based off the different business managers prior to you. Um, the FY19 actuals, are they confident numbers after your audit and whatnot, or is they, are they children of previous business directors, if that makes any sense? The numbers that are used in this spreadsheet are a combination derived from draft budgets that we've received plus what's also in our system. So where we knew that there was changes made in the draft budgets, those were adjusted so, for. So the, the base of my question is um, the accounting of where monies are spent. Like food service is a great example where initially you guys thought there was $100,000 or so deficit in food service and you realized, oh no, actually 80 of it, I'm making this up, 80 of it was accounted for, it was just put over there, not here. So um, 
So when I look at it, the yes, value. I am more confident in the FY19 adjusted column here than what I was three months ago. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's exactly. More confident. Um, yeah. I would say that, like the categorized things, there are some places where the spending isn't necessarily in the same category that right. was budgeted that. or will be budgeted. You know, you can see like just on the regular ed instruction teacher salary. You know, like we changed around where some of that teacher salary was budgeted. We didn't actually decrease that yeah. you know, first line by $1,200,000, you know? <laughs> so. I think it's important that you understand too that uh, I know that the turnover of the business managers is getting blamed for a lot of what happened, but that's not the whole story. The money was spent, I mean, and it was, you know, it wasn't all the fault of the fact that we, we had Marilyn Frederick here who was an experienced 30-year business manager who was here during some of those changeovers. And I'll admit, it, it, I'm not happy about what happened, but um, Tara's been here now, she, she'll have a year's anniversary in two weeks. And it's taken time to sort all this out. And time from our auditor, auditors, I really feel pretty confident in where we are now with all of that. But, you know, there's a critical shortage in business managers in the state and probably all over the country. We flew a lady in from uh, Arkansas to interview. We, we were beating the bushes trying to find good people. And you either have to buy one, steal one from someplace, or you have to, or you have to make one. And we don't have enough money to steal one because they're all being paid very, very well, probably more, more than we can do. But you know, we, we really, Marilyn has stayed with Tara to work on all those little questions that, that need to be answered. She's worked with the uh, VASBO group, and I'm pretty confident that, and she also has a great work ethic. And that's probably a very skill. She's very smart, but it's also, she's got a really good work ethic. And that's the kind of, elements or, or attributes, I guess you would say, that somebody has to have in order to be able to do this job because it's, and we beast, beefed up the, the, the office. Um, I guess we stole Ro Rose, you know? I mean, and that's just been a, a great difference. We now have two accountants, which is, you know, when we appraised this whole thing uh, and, and really took a long look at it, what do we really need? Um, we ended up letting go of about four people and, and then really kind of started over and, and really built something. And I really feel pretty confident about what we have now. Yeah, um, that's what I'm looking for, you know, is, is the confidence building. And I see it, and I'm, I, I see it in the last six months or so, especially. And, um, and I'm not saying solely that the, the turnover in business managers was the sole reason for the deficit, but just by, by having the turnover, you're just having less consistency and eyes on that budget, and that's where it, it ran astray. So. Well, there were some people that I got, I don't want to go into a lot of detail, but there were some, some things that didn't pan out the way I was led to believe they might, <laughs> if you know what I mean. We're on camera, so I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. But I, I will say that, you know, we learned a lot from what happened, um, and, and I really think that, that uh, we're in a much better place now, and we will be for the future. And I'm proud of that. Uh, it was really hard <coughs> during the during the time that we had to go through this. Did, uh, did I read somewhere that, that like the def the current this deficit is like of like a three or four <coughs> year, five year plan, like incrementally to get it back, or is it? I think we have three years. Three years. Three years. Yeah. Okay, thank you. We're hoping that through some uh, frugality this year, uh, we won't have to do that, and everything will be good. Yeah, I know that. I know that uh, the principals and I sat in a, about a day-long meeting trying to figure out what we could do without, uh, and we came up with about a quarter of a million dollars worth of things um, that we could hold the line uh, with, and I don't hear anybody complaining. I mean, they may, they may have complaints, but I haven't heard them. A, a quick comment and then two questions. The quick comment for the television camera there is you mentioned Rose. And I'll put on my select board hat. The Royalton select board really blew it 
by letting Rose get too much involved in all of the politics of the town and away from her strength as a finance manager. And I think she's going to be a huge asset for the schools in being able to focus on that job and not get involved in all the other stuff that you know, distracted from her real strength. So I think that's a real great asset. We could for see it in the first week she was there. For everybody. So that's that. So just to go on record for that. Did I hear you say we flew a candidate from Arkansas in here? Yeah. At yeah. our expense? Um, yes, a little bit of our, our expense. It wasn't completely our expense. Okay. Uh, and then my second question is the FY19 actuals. So these are not yet audited, but these are actuals that you have confidence in. Is that right? We are up these to are through, this is through last July. We are up to draft five of our FY19 fiscal audit with additional changes being made. This is closing the books on the year that ended last July. Yep. So I would hope that these numbers. They're getting closer to where they need to be. I mean, we're six, how many months past the close of the books? We should close books faster than that. Absolutely. I know it's hard, but we should close books a lot faster than that. The, one of the biggest challenges and why I believe Andrew, I think, touched on it earlier um, when the, in addition to the mergers happening, we also change software systems right. and we also change chart of accounts. So during so that, stuff. yeah, so there was a lot. And during that transition, stuff wasn't lining up, accounts may not have been trans transferred over. So as you're working through the year trying to keep the day to day operations, and then you had the business managers leave and you had short staff in the business office really trying to make sure that all of that closure to make sure the software transfers happened, everything, all the accounts transferred over, that really got bogged down in the process. So, so that's what's taken. So they were extenuating certain. Absolutely. What is the board's expectation in a regular year without extenuating circumstances? What should be, what's the board's expectation for how long it takes to close the books after the year ends? Is it 30 days, 90 days, six months? How long did it take to close the books out? We initially put a deadline of, I think it was like October, October 31st. 31st. October 31st, so like one quarter. Yeah. Okay. And the other challenge that you have in the state of Vermont is there are very few auditing firms who will audit school districts. And then my last related question is, so Chris was asking about the FY19 actuals. For the FY20 current year approved budget, does somewhere on the back of an envelope, are you tracking expenses to date and doing an, an estimate on where you're going to end this year? We do track our expenditures. The board and the administration gets an expenditure report from the business office every month. They also have access to the software system. So, so there, is there a full year projected where you think you're going to end up? I will do budget projections for, during the month of March. That's when I do when what you can expect to end at the end of this fiscal year. <coughs> I have to get through budget season and then through town meeting and then I it can work on projections. Hard. It would be helpful <coughs> for citizens evaluating budgets to see the, the, the actuals for the prior year, but to also see this year's approved budget and a current best projection on where we think we're going to end this year to compare for what you're asking for next year's budget. So you're going to ask the people in March for the, the following <coughs> budget. It would be nice to see a projected where we think we're going to end this July. Then, not this year, but in future years. I, I would really like to see that. That's just a group of practicing. That's a different. Uh, venue here, uh, but do you have any idea whether your carbon footprint has increased or decreased since consolidation? And I say that only in the sense that <clears throat> a bigger question is, what is education? What are we educating our youth for? To be better consumers, or are we we really want them to find a place in life uh, that they're content with. Uh, 
think there's a... Uh, and I'm saying that about carbon because it, it, if the predictions are right about uh, raising water, I mean, and the global warming, uh, we're in for some pretty uh, drastic times. And you look at our busing system right now is, is a pretty um, extreme. I mean, the big buses are going up delivering two kids uh, uh, in a certain place on the back road to Randolph there. Uh, it's, it's amazing uh, that we're able to do that. Uh, I mean, to me, I think overall our carbon footprint is hopefully going down. I, I think if anything, I know like from the food service side, I would say that Willie's done a lot to bring the, you know, the footprint down because there's a lot less pre-processed packaged food that's coming into the schools. It's a lot of on-site uh, prepared products by the kitchen staff, so I think 80% of uh, the food that con that's consumed by the students is produced in-house by, uh, by Willie and his staff, so there's a lot of less trucking and things that go on with that. Uh, to your point about busing, I mean, I think we've got the same sort of general bus routes, but now we've added the cross bus that goes from here to Bethel to take the, the middle schoolers over and to bring the high schoolers back over here. I think unfortunately for where we live at uh, currently with the technology that's out there for like electrified buses, like Burlington's got a few electric school buses, uh, but it works better there because they're in a flatter terrain. Whereas here, the going up and down the hills, that saps a lot of the power from the buses. So I think as new technology comes forward, hopefully Butler uh, bus service or whoever we contract with in the future would be keeping up with that. But, uh, uh, but I think we're doing the best we can. And, the ridership on the buses, you know, yeah, buses use a lot of fuel, but you know, every kid that's on a bus is one less kid that's in an extra car that's on the street. So hopefully, it's cutting down on some of the car transportation that families might have. So, um, I was asking another board too to look into try to recommend to Butler to get in on this electric buses. It's all that's all the Volkswagen money that's funding that the payoff from. The free food uh, that the government issues, uh, the B Department of Defense uh, issues, is uh, you charge, they charge for the freezing of it, the storage of it. And in some cases, uh, the storage is more costly than the uh, going out and buying the food uh, locally, uh, farm to uh, Plate to what is that one? Farm, farm to table. Plate or farm to something table program. Or farm to yes. school. We used to. Farm farm to school. School. We've never had that in our school system, but wouldn't that be a great thing? I think Willie buys as much of his product locally as he can. Uh, uh, he's not, I don't think he's here anymore, yeah, but he would be able to speak to yeah. it more. I can testify that he's had potatoes from South Royalton. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think the other factor in Willie's amazingness. It's a very, I, I suspect there's a lot less food waste at this point. Yeah. I know there's less food waste in the preparation end because I, I spoke to uh, a very nice uh, lady who works in the kitchen but not in it, uh, but she's married to her. Uh, and he's talked, she's talked before about, you know, one thing gets broken down and another thing gets, you know, the same way you, you or I might take care of leftovers, you know, It'll, it'll be, you know, there's a giant thing of carrots or something like that, and it gets used for, for three recipes rather than used for one recipe and tossed. Um, and, um, like, the safe and efficient use of as much of the food that they buy as possible is really laudable, and the fact that it tastes better means less of it's thrown away. I also think we can look at some of our programs that, um, I always say this wrong, I call it the Eco Program. I hope that that's what it is. Okay, because Eco Echo, you know, the Echo Program in Burlington. But the kids are going outside. They're learning about um, growing a garden. They're having opportunities to take care of apple trees. They're learning about recycling. I mean, if you look behind you, there's a great example of some <coughs> some education that students get every day, every time they walk up to the garbage can. So I think those 
small pieces of our curriculum which we're able to push is going to help with that carbon footprint with, as Chris said, the, the busing, unless we choose not to bus students, I don't think that we're going to come up with an efficient way um, just based on our ge geography. But we need to look at the whole impact of the school. And I think the kids getting out, working with apple trees, working to produce maple syrup, all of those direct, you know, look at all we, what we can do with our environment and how we can interact with it is going to help them become responsible adults later on. Yeah, just an observation too. I mean, climate change is tough. And I think local climate awareness, Peter, is important, and local agriculture is important. But we can't do anything here to stop China from building a thousand new coal plants a day and burning coal like crazy. So it's a huge global problem that well intended issues here are going to just make a gnat sprit of a difference. The best thing we can do for our children is to teach them to be independent, resourceful, you know, able to cope in changing circumstances, flexible. That's the education they need to deal in the, for the next 20, 50 years. Final questions? I guess the, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, yeah. last year you said, give me one more year. Give us one more year. <laughs> what, what do you say now? Well, I mean, I think we are showing some progress with uh, tuition revenue. You know, like we did get a very strong freshman class, and if we continue to get incoming classes like that, that'll make a big difference for the budget. Um, and yeah, certainly doing our best. Um, Peter, believe me, he pushed us hard, real hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thanks for your effort. Anyway. Yeah. So I guess the last thing, just to, um, we do have a couple of school board members up for re-election. One of them will be me, um, and I managed to miss getting my petition in on time, so if anybody would like to write me in for the three-year <laughs> position, I'd appreciate that, Sandra Jones. Um, I believe Jess is yep. running for the one year. There's a position on Shannon um, Cornelius. More uh, Cornelius. More Cornelius. Cornelius. Um, had moved to Bethel, so she resigned her position, and Jess is filling in her position for the end of this year, and then there'll be a one year position on the ballot to fill that spot. And she's running against Bob Gray on the ballot, so I don't know if you want to say anything. Thanks. <laughs> no, this is this has actually been um, very eye-opening to step fully onto the school board. Um, most of you might have seen me during the merger talks, um, as I was part of that group um, when this started. When I saw the um, budget forecast and some of the deficits, and uh, Shannon had decided to step down, I thought that that was a good good time to step back in. I had, um, as you were saying, seen a lot of potential in the merging of the schools, and um, I had hoped that it would go a little bit easier, a little bit less <coughs> rocky, and that we could see building some programs and saving a little bit of money too. Unfortunately, you know that's not come to fruition yet, but I do feel like we're getting there. I think we've um, made a lot of progress um, in the elementary school. I have seen with my children the eco program, being able to take some foreign languages, having a more diverse base of extracurricular activities, and hoping that that can continue in the future. And hope to stay on the board for at least another year to see how that that turns out and if we can keep this forward momentum going because like I said it was something that I very much believed in when we merged. And then I'm going to be, uh, my name's Lisa McCrory and I'm running for a three year position um, as a Bethel resident. My term is up this year so I'm just uh, running for the next to see my term, to, to, to continue it for another three years. I don't think I've You guys are all unopposed, or do you have opponents? I don't have anybody um, else that I'm running against for my seat. 
Is there any, did, there, did anyone file for the three-year position or nope. is it run an open? So it's an opening for Royalton for the three yeah. years, so yeah. Hopefully, somebody writes you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies, Thank you gentlemen, all so much for coming I think you've done a great job tonight.